All right, let's go. Uh, my name is Jason Hubbard. I'm Vice President of Partnerships and Alliances at Sales Intel, and you're here with us for Stepping Stronger into 2021, how to build or how to create a better B2B marketing strategy. So I already introduced myself. I also have David Hiltner with us. He's our uh, head of growth here at Sales Intel. Uh, always fun to uh, to have one of these with uh, with me and David because we live and breathe this stuff every day. In fact, we were working on exactly this stuff for us internally uh, just a few minutes ago, and uh, for for us to plan for 2021 our uh, sales and marketing initiative. So uh, obviously, this is really close to our uh, heart. Uh, David, welcome back, man. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. Um, looking forward to this. This is definitely a, a perfect uh, timing for for those who are getting ready for 2021, which I, I believe is going to be a, a, a much robust year uh, going into uh, into the uh, into the new new year. So thank you. Cool. Uh, so quick agenda today. Uh, we're going to talk quickly about preparing your database for marketing. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can apply that data um, to, uh, to your database and to your marketing efforts to improve that going into next year. So uh, talking about how to use uh, firmographic data to uh, be able to build out targeted list, uh, do your, your uh, segmentation uh, and target your, uh, your content creation. Uh, then next up talking about how to improve your form submission rates. Any marketer is going to be able to tell you it's a balancing act between getting enough data from your form submissions to be able to properly qualify and route uh, those inbound leads. Uh, versus trying to maximize that. And then last up is how to leverage intent data um, and all of the ways that, that can power your marketing efforts and improve your conversion rates. First up, 74%, that's three quarters of us say that converting leads into customers is their top priority. That shouldn't be surprising to anybody. Uh, you know, if you're not able to do that, then effectively you're not growing and nurturing your funnel. Uh, and then all of that effort is not actually turning into revenue. So that's going to be the focus today is how do you do that better and more efficiently? I'm actually surprised it's so low, that number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would, you would think that would be like 99%. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you wonder what the 26% that said that yeah, was. Yeah, what's, what's, what's happening thinking. there. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. So, uh, you know, taking the right account-based marketing approach. So, ABM's been a big buzzword, you know, especially the last few years. Uh, you know, with everything that's gone on this last year with COVID and all that we've had to do to adjust strategy, ABM's become even more important for anybody that's not familiar with it. Account that's account-based marketing, uh, and what that means is, I mean, exactly as it says, you're taking as opposed to a contact or lead-centric approach to your marketing you're going at it from a account-based uh, approach to it. So uh, segmenting, building out your content, uh, identifying who to go after, as well as assigning ownership and responsibility based off of account uh, uh, filters, account uh, profiles. Um, and so pieces to that, uh, you, know, you need to be able to leverage that, being able to go into new market, generating leads. Uh, it also drives a lot of, uh, uh, synchronization between what sales and marketing are doing uh, because sales is able to help inform marketing the type of accounts, uh, even all the way down to the specific accounts they want to focus on, and the marketing can support them in that. Um, any uh, any big keys to uh, to ABM uh, as far as what, what you're seeing or what we're working on, David? Um, you know, I, th I think that just kind of looking at your bullet points here, I think that the biggest uh, piece of it is locking in your ICPs. And for those who don't know, that's uh, ideal customer profiles. Um, understanding that, I think like really understanding exactly like who your database is, like that you should be going after. Um, you know, there's a lot of me methodologies out there in terms of like how you build those out. Um, but before you approach it, if you have not identified your ICP, I think that's the first and foremost thing that you want to do. Um, because if you're gonna spend money or uh, spend resources on an ABM approach, you really have to identify who your, who, who your ideal customer profile is. I mean, you don't wanna be all things to everybody. So the biggest thing is actually, you know, understanding like who your, who your database is, like shrinking down that market so that you can be effective because there's only so much time in a day and so much resources that you do have as an organization, especially if you're growing uh, extremely fast. So. Um, really developing out that that ICP, I think, is extremely important. So, um, and and if, for those who don't know, like where to start, um, you know, there's definitely, like I said, there's a bunch of different methodologies out there in terms of the ICP and how to develop that out. But 
a majority of them use like firmographic data, technographic data, and I'm sure we'll get into that in a second, Jason, but, yep. uh, but using that, that, you know, and understanding exactly like, uh, you know, what your database is telling you within your CRM uh, is also important. Like pulling, you know, your top 25 accounts that you sold last quarter um, is a good way to start and start looking for correlations within your database and understanding exactly like what uh, makes like what type of industry or do, do you seem to, to resonate with what type of, like I said, like what type of firmographic, like what's the size of the company organization, what's the revenue. Um, and then in your, inside your database, like how many demos did you, like how many demo, like once you scheduled the demo, like how many days did it take to sell uh, within those organizations? Um, and then, you know, looking at like, even like, uh, how many touch points did it take before you schedule those demos? Like all of that data, I think provides you with a good insight on who you should be targeting. And it also, once you identify that ICP, not only does it allow you to, to use that ABM marketing side of things, but it allows you to also like, uh, basically, uh, set, set the right course for your entire organization. Meaning that not only does the content kind of follow that, that process, but, you also are setting a course like with your with your um, customer success team, your sales team. Everybody's aligned at that point in time. So I think the biggest point I just want to I'm really kind of pushing this, but I think your ICP is sort of that that big beginning that you should really have a good understanding of exactly who you should be going after. So sorry to get long winded there, Jason, but <laughs> sure that that like, point, like I said, it's you know. it's near and dear to our hearts. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and I think one of the crucial pieces that you pointed out in there is this is this is an ongoing process. So you know, yep. you build your initial model, then you look at you know what's worked, what's not, what additional insights can you gain out of that, and then go back and refine that model. And even if you nail it, you've absolutely done it perfectly. Uh, none of that stuff's set in stone. So your product, your position in the market, and your your target customer are constantly shifting. So you know, this has to be a ongoing process uh, that, that really never stops going back and forth between sales and marketing. And then of course, a crucial piece to that is the reliability of your data, both yeah. internally. So whenever you're going and looking at your wins as well as what hasn't worked, so you can try and gain insights into what, what are commonalities across those? What, what types of lessons can you apply? Obviously, if things like industry and company size and stuff like that are not accurate inside your database, then you're unlikely to, to pull the right insights out of that. And then subsequently, where you go to apply those insights to identify net new accounts that you're wanting to target, that's got to be reliable as well. So both sides of that equation are uh, predicated on having reliable data in there. So when we talk about this, what are some of the things that you would look at uh, trying to leverage to try and figure out uh, you know, who to go after. Um, so some important things in here are listed on this one, um, you know, at the contact level, important details that you need to be able to identify those, those people in particular things like job title, as well as the information you need to reach out to them. And then on the account side, in particular things like industry, company size, where they're located geographically, um, what their revenue is, stuff like that. And we are, of course, just going through this process, David, of, you know, looking at, you know, what are the industries that you really want to target? What are the, right. the revenue, um, you know, metrics we want to be aiming at, going looking at the deals that we've recently closed and had success with, and what do those look like? Um, yeah, exactly. And I think, Jason, not only to just kind of go into a little bit more, but also even looking at the companies that you, you know, at, at, you know, and again, this is a quarterly optimization, right? So you're, you're constantly optimizing the process, but the, even the accounts that are growing, like after you've landed those accounts, like what accounts are growing the fastest and, and what, what industries and taking that, that information as well and adding it to your ICP is super important as well. So again, I think that this is, this is exactly like what you, you should be starting with and actually looking for. And, and the data points allow you to, again, just go after the right organizations and again, once you once you have this, it, it really kind of shrinks uh, that that sales cycle down as well. So like it all kind of works hand in hand. Um, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you again on this <laughs> side of it. But I just wanted to kind of point those out that it kind of works across the, uh, the the entire ecosystem that you have on the sales cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the other important thing to remember is, you know, obviously you want to look at where you've had successes and, and wins and want to duplicate those. 
but don't ignore where you've had misses as well. I mean, ne yeah. negative filters, things that you don't want to return results for can be as powerful, in some cases, even more powerful than those, those positive signals that you have. And so right. where, where you're like, hey, clearly this is not something we're prepared um, to be able to go after, or we're not stacking up against the competition. Those are really valuable things to know whenever you're building out these profiles. So, yeah, we talked about kind of how to go into a specific level, but how do you actually leverage this type of stuff and do it at scale? Because of course, marketing is a very large numbers game. Uh, you've got to feed a lot into the top of the funnel to, to get significant stuff that's going to move the needle out the bottom that's handed over to sales and ultimately turned into closed one deals. And so three particular strategies around that, the three different types of data we're going to dig into here are Firmographic data, uh, data enrichment, uh, and then last up, buyer intent data. So, firmographic data, this is one that we were you know, touching on there uh, earlier. But again, these are things like uh, annual revenue, industry, number of employees, location, uh, types of decision makers. And then the ways that you would leverage this in particular beyond just figuring out the accounts to go after, but that's that's not really enough. You want to also leverage that at a higher level, which is building out your content and your outreach strategies, your you know the the language that you're using, the pitch, the value propositions, all of that to target those different subgroups of your ICP. So you may have a half dozen, for instance, primary industries that you're going after. So in an ideal world, you're not going to go after them with all of the same collateral, all of the same pitch, all of the same pain points, because this is going to be different across all of those. Even within specific categories, you want to go down all the way to that individual persona level, because different decision makers, different roles that those companies are going to have, different things they're interested in, different problems they're trying to solve. And so the more you can segment and customize that content, based off of those different filters, the more effective your campaigns are going to be. David, you have thoughts on that? <clears throat> no, I mean, I mean, it's, I, it, I definitely agree with all of that. I think that the personas then is like sort of your secondary step to after you identify your, um, uh, your ICPs as the next step is to know like exactly like who the, who the influencers are within the organization and also then the, also the buyers um, that are in the organization. And, and like you said, I think personalizing the the messaging and understanding exactly like where they fall, like where they fall within the buyer's journey, um, is super important. And and really kind of mapping out those uh, those different journey points. And it's something that we've done here at Sales Intel, which is uh, really kind of identifying like our buyers, where they come in, who they are, um, and then where they come in at different stages of the buying cycle. So I think that that's super important to understand exactly like where that where they come in, and so you can identify and then also target them at the right, at the right point and understanding and having that, that targeted content that allows them to really kind of get the, the information that they need. Um, once you have identified the organizations, once you have identified the personas, uh, really kind of building out those, those campaigns and understanding like where they come in really allows you to be a little bit smarter in how you, uh, how you do your outreach. And actually at the end of the day, if you do it really well, it allows you to, it actually saves you time and money as well. So it's not, so you're not just like, you know, blasting everyone to everything and, you know, just trying to hope and, and pray that you're, you're hitting the right person. You're being extremely smart in your targeting as well. So, yep. Yeah. The other great feedback loop that a lot of people don't recognize or realize is how much, if you're doing this properly, it feeds into your, your content strategy. Exactly. So, you know, you may be completely off the mark, you know, whenever you start looking at what your content strategy is going to be for the year as far as, hey, we think we're going to really focus on this. But then you may find that those are not where you're really converting. Those are not the people that you're setting meetings with. Those are not the industries that are, that are really particularly effective. And so what you can do then is as you're building that ICP, you can also have that help to dictate and build out what that content looks like that you're that you're building out um, and you can do that in a you know data-based uh, approach to it of looking at hey what's working what's not and then we're going to need to actually plug that into the content that we're creating in support of the uh, the segmentation and the icp that we're building out that's right and, and jason just to further that point i think it also allows you to be you know to leverage um 
you know, that content into specific campaigning at the top of the funnel, middle of the funnel and bottom of the funnel. And I think that, uh, you know, using the, if you're, if you're talking about an ABM strategy, um, I find that most of the best ABM strategies that are out there that, that people are using are leveraging the content uh, to target not only the ICP, but also the buyers within that ICP. So um, going after and, and, and basically educating the, the user, um, I think that, or the persona, I think always like builds credibility, trust within your organization, all the good stuff that, that allows them to come to your site and not only you know, see, you know, learn from you, but also return looking for other type of content. I, you know, HubSpot does a really great job at that. Um, and that's what we're trying to build here. And I think we've done a pretty good job so far, but there's still a lot more to be done. But that, that being said, I think the most, the best organizations are the ones that constantly are teaching you, um, you know, uh, you know, building out that educational space that, um, that shows that it's not very salesy at the top, but more like, Hey, this is something that, and, and the more you teach somebody, the more that they trust you. And I think that that's kind of like where, you know, if, if you're doing this right um, and you're building out the right uh, type of modeling throughout that funnel, um, content really provides that, that, that backbone that you need to really kind of drive those, uh, those qualified leads into the, uh, into your ecosystem. So. Yeah, the great thing about a, an ABM approach to what you're doing is all, all of this winds up being able to be leveraged and, and pulled in across the board. And so you have, instead of having siloed efforts and having sequential uh, campaigns, you know, one targeted at this point, another target at that point, uh, what you're able to do is actually have everything working in concert with each other. So you can have air cover, which are ABM uh, directed ad campaigns. Uh, so you're getting ads, driving brand awareness and, and reinforcing messaging to the companies you're targeting or even all the way down to the individual decision makers that you're targeting. Uh, and then you've got you know, your email marketing campaigns, your content campaigns uh, that you're focusing at those same people from a top of the funnel value add content standpoint. But you're also working in tandem with your sales team because everybody knows who you're targeting, who you're working and who you're trying to, to convert. And so your sales team can then do, be doing their manual outreach, their phone calls, their LinkedIn outreach, their personal emails. Um, and then, oh, by the way, they can also be leveraging that exact same type of content uh, in a personal outreach context uh, that you're doing as your, your top of the funnel value add thought leadership marketing. And so, you know, like I was saying, instead of having ads that are sort of going out indiscriminately and you hope that connects with some people, and then they come in through your site and they're typically gonna be routed to a salesperson. They may or may not engage with your marketing content. Um, instead, you, you're hitting people from all of these angles all at once. And that of course drives a lot more engagement, a lot more conversions. So yeah, next up is, is intent data. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are aware of and interested in, but a lot of people are not even fully aware of what exactly intent data is. Broadly speaking, intent data is, is being able to dive into and be able to determine when a person or a company is showing intent and showing interest and showing a desire to take action on uh, or do something about a specific topic. And so, you know, at one level, everybody's actually already familiar with intent signals. Um, we're all using and leveraging those within our organizations. So if you're using Google Analytics to try and figure out uh, who's coming to your website, where are they coming from, what pages are they interacting with, uh, are there certain posts or pages or content that are, that are significantly driving traffic, you're already dealing with intent signals. Um, if you're looking at form fills that people are submitting on your website, um, if you have some sort of reverse IP tracking so that you can see who's actually hitting your website as far as which companies, um, all of these things are actual intent signals. If you're monitoring who's opening your emails, who's clicking on your links, again, all of these are intent signals because, of course, people that are doing these things, taking these actions, they're demonstrating intent. Um, but whenever people talk broadly about intent data, generally what they're talking about is the ability to be able to go out of those signals that are specific to you as a company that you're generating yourself and being able to see what people are doing that may not even be aware of you or your company or have ever been to your website. 
Um, and so companies that do that are like Bombora, who we have a partnership with to, to pull their intent data. In. And what Bombora is doing is they're tracking how companies are engaging with content across the web. So which blog posts are they looking at, which websites are they visiting, what things are they searching for, what you know, webinars are they registering for. Um, and based off of the consumption of that content and the signals baked into it, they're able to help you identify who's really engaged with certain topics. And we've got 7,500 topics that they're tracking across. So tons and tons of content uh, and topics that they're looking at against. And then the biggest you know, takeaway that I had when we first started uh, working with and talking to Bombora David was uh, the stat that, so if you've done everything that we talked about as far as building your ICP, looking at those filters, doing segmentation, all of that stuff, if you nailed it, you did it absolutely perfectly, you know exactly who your customers are and the accounts you need to be going after, only 10 to 15% of those accounts at any given time are actually actively engaged in researching or a buying decision or process at any given time. And so if you're going indiscriminately trying to convince all of those people to buy, then you're missing the boat by 85 to 90% of the, the time and attention that you're spending. Whereas if you can use intent signals like this, it'll actually really hone in on and focus on that 10 to 15%. Um, that are really interested in, in buying or, or trying to uh, evaluate or research uh, options and solutions. Yeah, I think that that, I mean, the buyer intent piece is a, it's, a, it's definitely a way for like, especially at top of the funnel or middle of the funnel to tr kind of drive that, that you're not like when you're, when you're setting up and you, like you said, like you have the ICP uh, nailed down, you have your personas nailed down. Uh, having buyer intent allows the like, um, uh, if you have an, if you have a strong SDR team um, where they're more top of funnel allows them to really kind of dive in and actually go after uh, accounts that are um, that are more like more middle of the funnel at that point. So you're kind of skipping a step there if you can um, with that with that buying signal so that you can say like, oh, look, this company is actually looking for a product like service like ours. Now it's about using that content that's more leveraged at that wherever they are within the funnel at the middle of the funnel or bottom of the funnel, you can leverage that content more effectively. Now you can also use this too, from an ABM strategy as well, like using that, that buyer intent, um, you know, understanding it, like in using your, again, your ad dollars to target those organizations, not only through, um, through your, your, your SDRs, but also through advertisements, again, using and leveraging the content that fits their needs, like when they are in that buying stage. So it allows you to be a little bit smarter in exactly who you're targeting as well. So again, that's, these are all great signals and allows you to like, again, just be a little bit smarter and save those dollars so that you're not having to uh, spray and pray basically um, with your, with your, with your, with your resources, especially if they're limited. So. Yep. Yeah, one of one of our favorite pro moves that we've discovered in you know eating your own dog food and, and working with Bombor's data is, uh, you know, breaking this up into different chunks. You can use the you can use the intent signals to help you focus on that content side. So instead of just being able to uh, segment and filter based off of things like firmographics, you know, industry, uh, you know, company size stuff like that, you can actually dive into what are, what are their pain points, what are they interested in. Um, what types of solutions are they looking for? You can also break things up into, you know, really, really highly focused intent signals. Like, hey, is somebody looking for specifically your solution or things that are tied extremely closely to your solution or competitors, for instance? In which case, those are probably really qualified uh, accounts that need prioritization and could probably be handed straight to an SVR to be following up with. Versus broadening that out and looking at broader intent signals. So like for us as a data company, we may use people searching for account-based marketing as a intent signal. Obviously, just because they're looking for account-based marketing stuff does not necessarily mean that they need a data partner. Uh, but there's a decent chance that they will. But that level of you know, lesser qualification is great to feed into your marketing engine. And then you look for those additional uh, intent signals that are coming in through your own marketing efforts. So you know, hey, they were broadly part of these intense signals. And then we saw, hey, they're really clicking on these links and reading our blog posts. And hey, they registered for this webinar. Um, we should really probably mark that as a, a, a sales qualified lead and pass that to a rep. 
Um, so again, really, really powerful things that you can do with intent signals. And then the last piece, so you know, bringing all of this together, you've done a great job of building your ICP, applying your filters, you've leveraged that to segment your list and help that inform the uh, the content campaigns and the content that you're creating. You're leveraging uh, intent data to be able to focus and prioritize on those accounts uh, that are really actually actively engaged and looking for a solution right now. Um, so if you've done all that really effectively, then you're driving these people to your website and you're ultimately trying to get them to convert off of, you know, filling out a form fill oftentimes on the website. Um, the challenge with that, of course, like I mentioned early on, is you're, it's a constant balancing act as a marketer. Um, you need enough data coming in off of those form fills to be able to properly qualify and route those leads. Um, but the more data points, the more, uh, uh, the more fields you put on a form, the fewer people are going to fill it out. Um, and so you need a way to balance that out. You also need a way to get as much data around those that come in and ultimately convert or ultimately don't convert so that you can then feed that back into your ICP model um, and whenever you're going back and identifying net new accounts to be able to focus on. And that's where enrichment really comes in. Uh, so whenever something comes in, it allows you to be able to limit the number of data points, number of fields that you're requiring um, to really just the absolute most essential because you know that you're going to be able to enrich that data on the back end. And then whenever you go and look at those successes and, and those failures that you've had in your campaigns, you've got really rich data that's, that's really complete to be able to go in and be able to pull from um, that's not only complete, but you know it's accurate. Um, and so all of these are really, really essential in closing the loop and all of those top of the funnel, middle of the funnel efforts that you're doing to bring that all the way down to the bottom of the funnel and then you know feed that right back into that top of the funnel model. Um, cool, David, do you have anything uh, to add to that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, you hit all the, I mean, Obviously, these are these are great. Uh, this is exactly what you need, especially with your data enrichment. You want to. The basic idea here is to you want to make sure that the the form fills are um, are accurate, um, but you also want to automate as much as possible so that it makes it as easy as possible for somebody to you know immediately get the content that they're looking for, or fill out the forms to get more information. I mean, the whole the whole piece of it is having that. Um, you know, offering multiple ways for a prospect to, you know, to connect with you and, and really just being able to and make it as easy as possible for them to, uh, to, to give up their information so that it's, you know, the show that, hey, they're interested in your product, you, you know, I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot of statistical data out there that it's like, you know, like something like if you put in enrichment, it's like, you know, it's, I don't want to quote the, the number at this point, maybe we can, we can throw that in there afterwards, but it, it's extremely high if you have enrichment in your form fields and, and make it as automated as possible so that while they're filling out the forms, it's already pre-populated within your form so that it makes it easy as possible for, you know, again, the good data to get into your CRM so that you're not, uh, you're not, you're not going around uh, wasting your time and, and resources to follow up with those individuals. So. Great. Well, we're, we're running out of time here. Um, so yeah, like I said, to bring it all together, um, you need to be able to have uh, repeatable, scalable, data-driven processes to, to really take the guesswork out of it and really dial in and focus on where you need to leverage your strengths, figure out what's working, what's not, learn lessons from that, and really take a scientific data-driven approach. And that's, you know, that's more important than ever um, you know, this year and certainly going into next year. Um, and so that's, that's really, you know, all really closely tied to the data that you have. Because, I mean, of course, if you don't have the data, it's not reliable, then you can't really do any of the stuff that we're talking about trying to do. Um, so, Cole, uh, like I said, we're, we're at the end of the hour. I don't have a hard stop um, and can hang around. I'm not sure about you, David, or anybody that has any questions. So, uh, happy to hang around as long as anybody has any questions for us. Um, go ahead and pop those in the Zoom side panel uh, if you have anything for us. And then, like I said, we will be sharing out a link tomorrow. You'll get an email with a uh, link to the recap page that will have both the recording uh, as well as the deck for it. You can also reply to that email if you have any additional questions for us. 
uh, David and I both are happy to answer any and all that you might have. Um, and Jason, can I give one pro tip on like yeah. how to design this? I think that one of the best ways to design this modeling, like as you're building it out is to use a, there's a lot of, uh, whether it's like whimsical or lucid charts, like really build out those flows. Like I'm a visual person. So I think putting it down, especially in a virtual world, um, putting down those, those flows on exactly like where the ICP, where the ABM comes in from the, from a, from a funneling perspective, like understanding exactly where that content plays into it, uh, helps like really kind of design that, that flow and it gets everybody on the same page too. And you can share that with your teams and everything. So I think that that's a, you know, something that is incredibly necessary when you're building out these complex uh, work cycles. Cause it, it would seem daunting to me, uh, you know, on the outside looking in like, Hey, look, you know, we're building out, we have ICPs, we have all this, you know, this data coming in from different areas. How do I manage this so that it makes it, uh, you know, flow in the right directions and how do I map it so that it makes sense? So again, I think using those different um, uh, systems that are out there to visualize exactly how it's coming in and how it's working uh, really helps kind of coordinate and get everybody on the same page. So just wanted to throw that out there as like sort of a, a tip that I use to, to really kind of enhance what we're doing. And again, making sure everybody's on the same page. So, yep. Oh, I, I know how you love your flow charts. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> so we do have a question uh, from the audience. They're asking, uh, how do you uh, how do you target and build ICP off of technologies used? So this is a great one. It's one we didn't touch on because, of course, we had you know limited limited time. There's all kinds of additional ways you can apply these strategies, but uh, two easy ways to do it. One, you can use intent signals around that to see. Uh, what technologies, what products people are showing intent or demonstrating intent around. But the other is you can use technographic filters. So with a data provider like us, we have a partner with, partnership with HD Insights. Um, they're the industry leader when it comes to tracking uh, technology footprints that, uh, that companies are using, what tech stack are they employing internally. Um, and so that's the easiest way to do it is you can, you can use one or the other or ideally both in tandem with each other. Uh, technographic filters, so where uh, somebody like HD Insights uh, or a data provider like us that's, that's using those technographic profiles from HD Insights um, to be able to identify what companies are using which types of technologies. Um, and you can do that broadly as far as technology categories, you can do that, uh, you know, a little bit more focused as far as uh, specific technology vendors, or even all the way down into uh, specific technology products where a vendor may have multiple different products that they, uh, that they sell. Um, it's a great question. Technographic for those of us that have a focus on specific technologies is another excellent way to do that segmentation and build out your ICP. Yeah, and I also believe that, you know, the technology, the technographic data also allows us to quantify also like to see exactly like what type of organizations are using, have a more robust uh, technology stack. So it allows us to be like to understand exactly like, hey, like these companies that are buying from us have a very robust uh, tech stack. So it allows us to like look at it from different angles, whether it's through a marketing tech stack or um, if you know that they have like a even a, a technology uh, tech stack that's like super uh, complex, uh, we know that they're willing to spend more on products uh, that will help enhance their overall experience. So it gives us sort of that inside baseball a little bit too to see exactly like what they're actually uh, what they're leveraging um, outside of just our own our own product and service. So it gives us sort of that, that look at like, hey, look, they, they're using this, this, and this, and they can also be using one of our competitors as well. So it allows us to be a little bit smarter in who we're targeting. So, yep. And then we have one from, uh, looks like a, a sales Intel customer. Um, they were wanting to uh, either repeat, what are, what are your favorite uh, uh, flowchart tools that, that you like to use? Uh, so I, I like using Lucidchart, um, but there's also, um, for the novice, I think Whimsical is also pretty good. I, I believe they both offer up free uh, versions too. So like you can test it out and, and try it. Um, uh, so you can you can try out both of them. So it's Whimsical and Lucidchart is one of the two that I um, that I use quite frequently. Great. And then, yeah, if you want, uh, if you've got additional questions or details around that, like I said, feel free to, uh, to reply to the email recap that's gonna go out tomorrow and uh, we'll be able to, uh, uh, 
sorry, uh, and we'll be able to, to answer that more detail. Um, so we did, uh, I know you came in late. Um, we did not have a flow chart up on there, um, but David has plenty of flow charts that he has built around our sales marketing process. So um, yeah, I encourage you just reply to that email tomorrow whenever that goes out. And uh, we'll be happy to uh, to answer and, uh, and give you any more details around that. All right, I'll give everybody one more chance to uh, to drop anything into the Zoom side panel. All right, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, been great to have everybody on here. Hope everybody has a great holiday that's coming up here. Absolutely. And uh, Happy David. Thanks, yeah. thanks as always, man. Yeah, no problem. I enjoy these. Love it. So All thank right. you. Thanks. Thank you.